Now that we know how to balance those redox reactions, let's look at one that takes place between a solution of copper and some solid zinc. So you can see in the picture there we've got a, a strip of zinc metal and it's being put into a copper sulfate solution. If you put that piece of zinc into that copper sulfate solution, eventually you're going to start to get some copper plating out on the surface of the zinc. If we were to pull that zinc strip out of the solution, um, you'd start to see that reddish penny colored copper forming on the surface of the zinc. So that's why it looks so dark there and that beaker on the right, um, it's forming that reddish penny colored plating on that zinc surface. You'll also notice that the solution is going from a bright blue and it looks like the solution color is fading. It's looking a little more pale on the right hand side there. That's because it's turning into a zinc sulfate solution which is colorless. So our solid zinc is losing electrons. It's being oxidized in this reaction as it turns into the zinc sulfate solution. And the aqueous copper is gaining electrons. It's being reduced as it turns into solid copper that's plating on the surface of the zinc. So electrons are being transferred, but because those electrons are being transferred in a direct redox reaction, no useful current is generated. So can we take that thermodynamically favorable spontaneous reaction and get some useful current out of it? We can if we separate the solutions. So in order to obtain some useful current, we have to put the two solutions in separate beakers connected through uh, with an external wire. So you can see in the picture there on the left hand side, we have a piece of zinc metal and it's in a solution of zinc sulfate. So the zinc and the zinc sulfate aren't going to react with one another, right? If you tried to do a single displacement reaction, zinc solid plus zinc sulfate, the zinc and zinc aren't going to switch places with each other. So nothing happens in that beaker by itself. On the right hand side we have a similar situation, a piece of copper metal in a solution of copper 2 sulfate the copper metal and the copper sulfate solutions aren't going to react with each other. If we connect them with uh, those two solids with a P, with a wire that goes from one piece of zinc to one piece of copper, that reaction can take place but the electrons are going to transfer through that wire. One little tip to help you remember uh, it'll often ask you in these electrochem problems to identify which substance is being oxidized, what's being reduced, which uh, electrode is the anode, which one's the cathode, which one's negative, which one's positive. So our zinc in that reaction was the one that was losing electrons. It was going from solid zinc to aqueous zinc, turning into a solution. So it used to be neutral now is plus two. Zinc is the one that's being oxidized. Oxidation always takes place at the anode of a battery and a way to remember that is that oxidation and anode are both starting with vowels. Our copper in that reaction was the one that was being reduced. It started in copper sulfate solution and it turned into copper the element plating onto that zinc surface. So the copper's the one that's gaining the electrons in this reaction. It's being reduced. So that reaction, the reduction reaction, always takes place at the cathode. And the way that you can remember that is that both R and C are both consonants. So the oxidation will always take place at the anode. The reduction always takes place at the cathode. If we are trying to figure out which electrode is the negative one, which one's the positive one. Since the zinc is the source of the electrons, it's the one that's losing the electrons. It provides the negative electrons. So we call that our negative, uh, our negative part of our battery. The uh, 
copper is the one that's gaining the electrons. It's attracting the electrons, if you want to think about it that way. So if it's attracting the electrons, it must be the positive part of our battery. The other way to remember that is that you guys have learned about cations and anions when writing the formulas for ionic compounds. Uh, the cation was always the positively charged ion, right? And the anion was the negatively charged one. You can't just have a wire, though, and expect your battery to work. You also need a part of a battery called a salt bridge. And so you can see underneath that wire, there's an upside down U-shaped piece uh, that's blue there, and it has some copper 2 sulfate solution in there. The salt bridge with copper 2, or not copper 2 sulfate, excuse me, potassium sulfate, uh, allows for charge balance. Electrons are leaving the zinc side of our battery. And so if electrons are leaving the zinc, that part of the battery is becoming increasingly more positive. And so we need to keep our charge in balance there so we can have some sulfate ions leave our salt bridge and move towards the zinc side to keep that left-hand side of our battery neutral. So you could see in that salt bridge there's an arrow pointing to the left for the sulfate ions so it can head towards that zinc and even though we have negative electrons leaving we're going to bring in the negative sulfate to balance that out. The salt bridge is also there to help keep the charge in check for the right hand side. Since electrons are headed towards the copper side through that wire, that solution is going to start to become increasingly more negative. So the potassium ions from our salt bridge are going to move towards the copper side to help keep it neutral. So you can see the K plus one with the right hand arrow uh, potassium is going to head to the right, sulfate is going to head to the left in order to keep our charge in balance. So just a little summary there of motion of where everything is going. Uh, your electrons are going to move from the anode, the negatively charged part of your battery, to the cathode through that wire. And then you also need your salt bridge part where you have anions and cations moving through that part in order to keep the charge in, in check, despite the fact that you have electrons leaving or moving in. Those electrons are driven from the anode to the cathode by something called the electromotive force, the EMF. You guys learned about that in your physics days. This force causes the electrons to move due to a difference in potential energy between those two electrodes.